Hello, everybody. I am Mariana Matsukato. I'm a professor at UCL, uh, where I direct the institute that's hosting this, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. I will introduce our wonderful panel in just a minute, but just to say that this is the first event in our new series called Walking the Talk, Getting Serious About the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And we're you know, really happy that a lot of you have joined us today. And this, will, of course, will be recorded. So those who haven't been able to join us can uh, watch it at a future time. So first of all, uh, it, you know, the context is, of course, that since 2015, we've been talking about and thinking about the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them. There's 169 targets. There's 232 indicators. And these are you know, really inspiring and issues around democracy, ethics, inclusion, sustainability are really kind of cross-cutting across all of them. And you know, one of the questions we're super interested in is how can we actually develop moonshots within it that we can actually say yes or no, did we achieve it? And of course, the kind of broad areas of health, climate, digital are kind of the general spaces where we can think about those moonshots. And today we'll be especially thinking about the AI digital space. But the SDGs in general, what's really important is how much kind of you know, unprecedented and somewhat unprecedented um, political support that they have uh, gathered. And they've actually come about, I didn't realize this, from a huge amount of consultation to the run up of 2015 when they were actually set in stone and signed up to. But really, we should be constantly discussing them, contesting them, asking how to make them also more specific, but also how to use them in some ways as a dashboard to steer our economies. We all know that GDP is not a perfect indicator, uh, but it's not about you know, replacing GDP with one number. It's what is the proper dashboard we, we, we need to guide how to move, just like with the car, if you only knew how much gas was in it, you'd crash if you didn't also know how fast you were going and so on. So what does it actually mean to walk the talk of these SDGs is what uh, we'll be asking. And the reason it's really important for us at IPP is the, cent the Institute, which is a full-blown department, I set it up and uh, founded it at UCL in 2017 because I felt that there was no lack of people like myself and, and others talking about kind of where we wanted to go in terms of structuring our economy, but we didn't have enough tools on the ground. And so IPP is really structured in this way to kind of push the frontiers of thinking about things like public value, public purpose, mission orientation, but also what is the new curriculum, literally the training, the education we need on the ground for civil servants to redesign policy with purpose at the center. But also we work with policymakers very actively, not as a ex post thought at the end of a paper, you know, here's the policy conclusions, but very much from the beginning. And in this space in particular, for example, we've been talking to a lot of um, competition uh, ministers about why we actually need to bring together how we understand innovation with how we understand competition. And a recent paper we wrote called uh, Hidden Dragons, Crouching, no, Crouching Tigers, Hidden Dragons is all about how to actually change the reporting structure of tech companies so it actually reflects how they're building up their monopoly power across different segments of the market when actually the reporting structures currently don't break it down by segments. So again, how we actually do reporting as opposed to ex post worries about taxation or redistribution and so on. It's kind of that kind of setting up the conditions right in the first place so we don't create a mess and require to pick it up later. Um, anyway, so in that context, we're like incredibly happy to be hosting this event and today's panel, who we'll introduce in a second, will explore how digitalization and AI can empower public value creation, citizens' rights, human rights, and public purpose in the context of the SDGs. And while digital platforms, of course, have created an immense amount of value, you know, we all use them for all sorts of great uses. They've made us be able to collaborate globally in ways that we never thought we could. They also can be used, of course, to extract value. So that kind of differentiation between value creation, value extraction. Of course, if we don't even know how to distinguish it, I often argue we don't know how to distinguish profits from rents, let alone value creation, value extraction, that can create harm. It can generate really perverse uh, outcomes, including massive inequality. And I, I really recommend everyone who hasn't to read Shoshana Zuboff's wonderful book, Surveillance Capitalism, who really helps to debunk some of the myths around the political economy. You know, she says, 
you think you're searching Google for free. Well, guess what? Google searching you for free. And what does it actually mean to really also look at that from a competition perspective? And of course, since the onset of the pandemic, while businesses went bust and shops was shut and, you know, people um, suffered immensely, we then had the market value of a lot of the companies that use AI actually increasing immense amounts. So Amazon's market value increased during the pandemic by 650 billion. So to do capitalism differently, we really need to be shaping these markets, not just fixing them. Oh, it's too little, too late. And in that context, it's a huge pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. Um, and two of them are actually great friends. Uh, Caris, I don't know you well enough, but I hope you will also become a, a great friend in the future. But Gabriela I've known for a long time, Gabriela Ramos. She's currently the Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences of UNESCO. But I met her when she was Chief of Staff and Sherpa at the OECD and really being critical to helping the OECD actually rethink the economic theory. She ran this uh, whole project around new economic narratives um, at the OECD, because we can't get better policy without also a better theoretical framing, and there's a feedback between the two. Uh, professor Carissa Veliz is Associate Professor in Philosophy at the Institute for Ethics in AI and a fellow at Hertford College, University of Oxford. And she's the author of a new book called Privacy is Power, um, oh dear, if you hear a bell ringing, that's my children. Hopefully someone else will let them in. Um, and unfortunately she can only stay for one hour. So if you see her leave, it's not because she's bored. <laughs> uh, she has warned us. Uh, so she'll be leaving at 4.30. And Ian <clears throat> Hogarth um, is a visiting professor of practice at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. He's also an entrepreneur, an investor, a writer. He knows a lot about the actual technology, but also the financing of AI, and most importantly, he's the author of a really very widely read report called The State of AI, which comes out yearly and, and really helps to shape people's understanding of the much broader uh, field, technological, political, um, and also in terms of something he's raised a lot of awareness on, which is AI nationalism. So over the next 45 minutes, each of our speakers will have an opportunity to share their opinions, research, and experience about the ethics and public value of platforms in AI. And we'll have about 30 minutes at the end to take questions from the audience. So I've already spoken way too much. <laughs> Why don't we just begin with Gabriela, given what she does, where she works, the UN being such an important, you know, global governance <laughs> institution. If you can just kind of lay out for us, Gabriela, what you think the big questions are around, um, you know, ethics, AI, and the SDGs, and where the bottlenecks have been. Because, of course, people talk about AI and ethics, and yet we have huge issues that, you know, we read about in the paper every day. So how do you, you know, how can you help us frame it in the most ambitious broad way as possible? Well, thank you, Mariana. Thank you for inviting me. Great to be here with Jan and, and Teresa. And, uh, and yes, I, I feel that the, the, you put the, the question in the right format, because what are the big issues as we see it? Uh, we in UNESCO and the social and human science sector, we just uh, 193 countries signed to the ethical recommendation uh, for artificial intelligence. And, and we are hopeful that that means that probably the thinking behind these issues is changing. But the fact is that the real question here is whether this technological revolution that is delivering so many impressive services, just like discovering the vaccine in one year, would have never happened without the analytical capacities of uh, artificial intelligence, without the computing capacities, uh, many of the discoveries and the, and, the, and the real applications for good uh, are there. But the fact and the real questions is whether they are going to help us address the major challenges we are confronting or they are going to make them worse. And the fact is that without the ethical reflection, I feel that they are making them worse. One of the elements that you and I have been discussing for years is how do we address the question of inequalities, inequalities of income, inequalities of opportunities, inequalities of outcome. We were worrying about that before the financial crisis, uh, and guess what? I mean, it has just gotten worse because the COVID, what did was to put a mirror in front of us in terms of those that were able to waive the impact of the pandemic, even profit from the pandemic, and those that were just pushed even behind where they were before. Uh, you have seen the figures of Oxfam, uh, additional market capitalization or, or, or 3.5 trillion for uh, digital platforms and big corporates. 
and then a major uh, massive loss uh, for uh, labor markets around the world of the very same site. And then 130 more uh, uh, people in poverty. So in terms of the SDGs, we're just moving back. Uh, more violence against women, less uh, life expectancy, more inequalities, and then you have the digital transformation. And what happens with the digital transformation? Very high concentration, five countries producing the majority of the technologies, uh, 200 firms, almost all the patents, data access, data ownership, data gathering, and data is a new currency in the hands of the few. And then this space of free regulatory environment with the thinking that the regulations always stifle innovation, which we know is not true, and therefore the downsides of the technologies, which is again, creating misinformation, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, and just translating the, 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 the biases and discriminatory outcomes that we can have in the real, real world to the digital world. And therefore, I don't want to bash the technologies because it's not about the technologies. It's about the regulatory framework and it's about what we, as, as the people in charge in the international institutions and in the governments, are providing for the framework in, in which these technologies can deliver for good. So the framework needs to change. And that's why we have uh, uh, produced this ethical reflection that, as you say, is an ex ante. We do not need to wait for it to, to harm, uh, but, but we need to think on equity issues beforehand. We need to think about ethical issues, inclusion issues, before we start deploying the technologies. And this is as simple as to asking, is the, is the teams producing the technological progress diverse? Well, it's not. 85% of all AI developments are done by male only teams, particularly from the North and women are not represented. Only 15% and not at the top of the, of the uh, are the small and medium size being benefiting from really not only using the technologies for developing the technologies for their own purposes, not really. Because again, how do we share the data? How do we gather it? How do we ensure that it's not only the few that benefit from it? is not happening. And then the real downsides of these technologies, the, the, the bias in the algorithms, we have seen how many examples, not only of the platforms, because of course the exercises of the recruitment tools of Amazon that show how much the algorithm discriminated against women, well, guess what? But somebody put the elements there and the conceptual framework to discriminate against women. But we have the example of the Netherlands, the government of the Netherlands using an algorithm to determine who, who, who should receive benefits in the social system and discriminating against all the refugees and migrant descendants. And so really we need to go back to more responsible, more accountable and more transparent technologies. And for that, we need an ethical framework and that's where we are. Thanks, Gabriela, super, super interesting. And in fact, your kind of call for an ethical framework, there's no, better person to follow than a philosopher. And we know philosophers think a lot about ethics, but first, just another reflection of what you've just said. You know, sometimes, like one of the things we talk a lot about in IPP is why we need to be co-creating and co-shaping markets, not just fixing them, but that issue of actually making sure the business models are right, as opposed to thinking that business and value and technology is like there, and then we have to just kind of regulate it. We can actually choose different business models. We know, for example, the whole debate about you know, maximizing shareholder value versus another way to govern a business. But I think what you're talking about is also how do we create the algorithms differently in the first place? We shouldn't forget, of course, that Google's algorithm initially was actually financed by the public sector, by the National Science Foundation. There's no reason why the grants themselves that are provided even to future researchers, if we go back, you know, what might have happened back then, could it themselves actually have some of this conditionality at the center? Uh, again, to have that kind of ex ante, not always an ex post. But anyway, Carissa, please illuminate us as a wonderful philosopher on the ethics um, and how policymakers can use them to really build and invest and govern in a proactive way. Thank you so much. There's so much to say and so much work to do in this field. And one place in which we can, from which we can derive inspiration is medical ethics. Before medical ethics came around, um, all kinds of things happened to you at the doctor's office that we would think outrageous today. And of course, digital ethics is much more political, so it's not going to be enough. But we can learn a lot from medical ethics, not only from the things that we did right, but also from the things that we did wrong and, and where we have failed to, to regulate properly. But one thing that I think is absolutely necessary 
is to make sure that not just any algorithm can go out into the world without being supervised. So at the moment, pretty much anyone can design an algorithm pretty much to do whatever it wants, whatever he or she wants it to do, and let it loose into the world without any kind of supervision. And that's that's insane, that's wild. And uh, we would never allow that to happen with pharmaceuticals, and um, not even in a case of extreme measures like the coronavirus pandemic. The vaccines had to go through a peer review process and through um, rigorous randomized control uh, trials. And algorithms don't have to do that, even though they can be just as harmful as a really powerful drug. So one of the things that we have to learn from are agencies like the FDA, for, for instance, and similar agencies that are used to regulating products and see like, how do they do it? And what kind of randomized control trials should we submit um, algorithms to? And what kind of algorithms? Maybe not all algorithms, but definitely ones that um, deal with very important spheres of life the ones that decide whether somebody goes to jail or not, whether somebody gets a job or not, whether somebody gets a loan or not. And then another broad area in which to focus is, as you said, Mariana, um, business models. I think that's crucial. For a long, long time, we've known in society that we can't allow just any business model to thrive just because it's profitable. Because stealing is incredibly profitable, but that's not enough of a justification to allow it as a business model. And for the same reason, we shouldn't allow the commodification of personal data. Personal data is just not the kind of thing that should be bought or sold. Even in the most capitalist of societies, we agree that there are certain things that are outside the markets. We don't sell people, we don't sell um, votes. And for the many of the same reasons for why we don't sell votes, we shouldn't sell personal data. It ends up being used in the same way. It erodes equality because we are not being treated as equal citizens anymore. We are being treated on the basis of our data. So if men, for instance, are, are shown ads for higher paying jobs, equality of opportunity has gone out the window. It erodes democracy because it allows for personalized propaganda and for um, kind of information ghettos. And it's a national security threat. Just the, the negative externalities are just too many. And the advantages that we can get with, with, with um, kind of personal ads and other advantages, we can get them in other ways. We can use contextualized ads. We don't have to give up really any important benefit from the technology to have a system that is much more supportive of democracy. Thank you. Really, really interesting uh, example to the medical sector, which, as we know, is also highly imperfect. <laughs> you know, we currently have what Dr. Tedros calls vaccine apartheid where 80% of the vaccines are being hoarded um, by 10% of countries. And of course, the mission there is to vaccinate everybody uh, around the world. So the technology itself is not enough. So it's, it's, it's really important what you're saying. And then also where the bottlenecks are when we actually don't have clear outcomes of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so vaccinating everyone would, of course, then influence how we design the collective intelligence, the sharing of the knowledge around the therapeutics, the diagnostics, the vaccines to create what's often called collective intelligence instead of private sector kind of rent seeking. So thanks so much. Um, why don't we turn now to you, Ian, as, as someone who has had experience actually using the algorithms for your own businesses. You're currently financing some really interesting uh, businesses around the world from your kind of role as venture capitalist, but also your incredibly important work on the state of AI and your kind of worries around nationalism, also the dual usage around military uses and so on. Just Please come in. Yeah. Um, first of all, I thought it might be interesting to pick up on something that Carissa was saying. So um, I think you're really right to make the parallel with medical ethics. And, you know, the AIs um, are being used to design drugs, right? So we had the first um, AI designed drugs going to clinical trials, but they're going into clinical trials, right? Because we have an existing sort of ethical framework for evaluating those products before we give them to consumers. So I think in some ways, like the better we do in general in society, like AI is ultimately, you know, replicating lots of things we're already doing in society. We make progress on, for example, regulation of drugs. We make progress when we want to have AI design drugs. Um, the other thing that I, I think is worth maybe mentioning um, in relation to what you said is, is kind of around, around how we regulate bias. Um, you know, you, um, uh, Gabrielle and, and you, and you both brought it up. And I think 
part of what's interesting here is there is regulation coming through. So, you know, you had a, a bunch of high profile instances in the US um, and the UK and China, actually, over the last few years where computer vision was used um, uh, to basically wrongfully arrest or um, fine people in all three markets. And there was a kind of a, a sort of a load of regulation that got, got kind of developed and passed. And I think the one that is the most interesting is what um, Jay Inslee passed in um, Washington state. And they basically passed um, a law that essentially state law, right? That said, if law enforcement is going to use AI to do facial recognition technology, for example, to detect a, you know, a potential criminal, um, that software has to be accessible to an independent third party, like fine, that sounds kind of you know, sensible, via an API to assess for accuracy and unfair performance differences across characteristics like race and gender. And if they find an issue, the provider has to develop and, and, and um, implement a plan to mitigate that within 90 days, right? So you've got this very interesting thing that says you have to provide access, but not just access of a, of a kind of human regulator operating at human speed, you have to provide access to a machine, right? And then you finally have to remedy any issues within 90 days. So you actually, what I think is very interesting about that regulation is it allows the, the sort of, the, you know, the kind of the, pe the regulators to move at the speed of the tech companies, right? Tech company deploys something, something new, it's not correct. You know, you, you have a, a law enforcement, a kind of a regulator that is essentially probing it with the same tools and, and, and able to basically, you know, uh, interrogate the software using software. And so I think there's something about that kind of that that solution that to me feels sort of, you know, like a, an interesting model for how we regulate this stuff in general. Um, going back to the general question of regulation, I, I think that um, think about this at kind of a, a few different levels. I think there's kind of the general social consequences of deploying more powerful AI systems. So that's, for example, um, you know, these examples of like wrongful arrest or use in the judiciary or use in um, access to finance, um, sort of social sort of consequences of this becoming used in more and more parts of society. Um, and there are like very bad consequences um, from, you know, getting that wrong. But there are these two other areas we've kind of, I don't think we're discussing enough. And one is around, um, you know, uh, they're both broadly fall in the category of existential risk, but it's kind of military uses of AI and, the unintended consequences of developing very powerful software that is more intelligent than us. So in the in the in the former, the kind of the military uses of AI, um, I think it's kind of you can think of this stuff as kind of like reasonably analogous to nuclear weapons, because you're essentially giving uh, one uh, country's military uh, sort of a lot more intelligence, right? Whether it's in autonomous weapons or swarms of drones or um, developing novel kind of, you know, novel strategies that a human couldn't think of. And what is kind of most concerning about that is that the military um, use of military AI is directly implementing work that is being done by academics. So, you know, DeepMind, OpenAI, Google, uh, you know, Cambridge Oxford, they all work on, for example, deep reinforcement learning, which is a category of the um, of, of AI research that looks at AI is being able to operate very you know, intelligently within a given environment. And that, you know, the, the techniques developed there that were used for um, defeating Go or uh, you know, playing at a superhuman level of StarCraft or Dota, those techniques have directly translated into military contexts. So they've been used to train, um, you know, uh, train um, AI dogfighters. Um, and in the most recent sort of uh, uh, attacks in Gaza, Israel explicitly claimed that this was the first AI war because they had used these, you know, these techniques in anger. So you've got this, this sort of fundamental problem that we're put, investing so much energy in making these systems more powerful, and that directly translates into um, military use and having militaries exponentially gaining in, in, in their capacities, to me, feels like a sort of a, a, a very significant kind of escalation of, um, of kind of existential risk in the, in the same way that um, nuclear weapons change the sort of calculus of, of war. Um, and the, the second thing that like, I personally am probably most concerned around is just general existential risk. So, you know, from, uh, you know, kind of 2000 through to 2010, um, the sort of amount of compute and, and sort of the implicit intelligence of AI systems 
um, was roughly doubling every two years along, along the, the kind of path of Moore's law. And from 2010 onwards, um, which is around the time that DeepMind got going and the, the big developments that DeepMind made, you had um, a pretty significant change in how rapidly um, the compute of these large systems uh, increased. And it went from every two years doubling to every three to four months doubling. And it's been doing that for the past 12 years. So you basically got, you know, you already had an exponential curve that got steeper from 2010 onwards. Um, and, and, you know, many people in the AI field look at that, escal that exponential escalation in, in, in capabilities as a very substantial risk. So there was a, a brilliant researcher who did some work to basically you know, estimate that by 2020, 2052, if you continue those trends, we would, we would have a, um, a machine that was kind of comparable to the human brain. Right? So there was kind of a, a prediction of general intelligence occurring around then. And there's been this survey that's been done of, um, you know, sort of high end machine learning researchers over the, over the past years by the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. And they, um, they asked various different questions to these top researchers. But um, one of the questions is, you know, do you think we should be investing more in AI safety than we are today? And, you know, back in 2016, 49% of respondents said yes. And like in last year, it was 68%. There's this increasing awareness that across everybody that I talk to in the sort of high end of the field that that we are starting to play a pretty dangerous game by making these systems more powerful without understanding how to make them safe. And the um, the most concrete example I give you, going back to something that Carissa said, is um, you know we've just been through the pandemic. We know how serious it is to be to be playing around with viruses, right? And like. You know, whether it was a lab escape, whether it wasn't a lab escape, I think we all believe that engineered pathogens is a bad idea, right? Um, and if you want to engineer a pathogen, you have to go and do it inside a biosafety lab, right? Which is regulated globally by, you know, by, by, by governance. Um, and that, you know, at the same time, there are a couple of researchers at Microsoft in 2021 who used AI to engineer more powerful malware, right? And that's something that any software company on earth can currently do. If you want to make a sort of a computer virus that's ever more powerful, you could just do that. There's no kind of fundamental, you don't have to do that in the equivalent of a biosafety lab. So I think the most important regulation we need is something that starts to treat these large AI labs in the same way we would treat someone working on engineered pathogens. So something equivalent to the biosafety sort of standards um, and ethics. And that's why I think what, what Carissa, you said about kind of you know, really thinking about biology and, and medical history as like a great lens here is such a powerful uh, way of looking at the problem. Thanks, super useful. And also um, just that example that you gave and, you know, like the question of who's financing what and does it matter? Like we're, we're sort of talking about big global objectives and ethical principles and Gabriela talked a lot about principles, but there's also something about what we know about governance structures and different types of institutions and of course regulation doesn't happen just kind of like you know on the top of structures it ends up actually trying to influence uh how organizations work and how they work together so if we can maybe turn to that a bit because ai of course innovation in ai is a bit different at least from even the previous waves within tech that were financed to a large extent actually by the government you know the internet itself the state underwrote most of the long-term high-risk early stage investment. Now AI, of course, is increasingly funded from within the, the private sector. So if we can just maybe talk a bit about that, um, because, and also at the same time, perhaps what's happened in Europe and comparing it to what's happening in the US in terms of the new digital act in Europe and whether, you know, on the one hand, is it enough? Probably not, but where do we think it can be pushed to become a, a good example of regulation along the lines that we've talked about. And why is there also this kind of big difference, actually? Like, why is Europe in some ways more willing to go down that space? And does that also have to do with its kind of variety of capitalism? Uh, there's not only one way to do capitalism, of course. So, Gabriela, why don't I come back to you, given also how important you have been, I think, in helping a lot of us who work with the UN always come back to this issue of narratives and economic, you know, the fact we can shape capitalism differently well I, I i let me just come back to to the to the recommendations on ethics of artificial intelligence because the task is not easy mariana you have been calling on uh, investing in the capacities of governments not to outsource it no uh, not only to intervene when there is a market failure not to go when the, the 
whole thing has broken down. And I have to say that, that the first thing is to build these different narratives, but it's not yet there. And I'm, I'm really always so surprised because I mean, I thought it was going to happen after the financial crisis that everybody was going to say, yes, the free market is not free market doesn't exist. We really need to go back to the human rights and how do we ensure that we have more inclusive and sustainable worlds, which is uh, core to the SDGs. After the COVID, I am not seeing that discussion happening in the way it is, maybe because we are wired to the GDP growth and maximization of economic benefits, and maybe because the concentration at the top in certain industries and the lobby make it so difficult to really go for the real uh, uh, change. But the reality is that the, the recommendation that we got has that exactly the ethics of, of artificial intelligence that we got 193 countries to sign in last November has that narrative. The narrative of ensuring that the technology delivers for human rights, delivers from fundamental freedoms, delivers for environmental sustainability. So this is the big thing. Delivers for accountability because the problem is that even the way these technologies are being developed, then it's not even easy to understand and Ian said it, Who's to blame? Are you going to sue the algorithm because you didn't get a job or you're going to call who you call if your daughter is not admitted in the school because somebody put in the definitions that uh, they don't like? Italians. Well, who do you sue? Well, I think that even that part of, of, of accountability is, is not yet there. And that's why this uh, recommendation has at least this very strong narrative. But then the other part is the policies. Policies matter. And we need to make sure that we understand how the definition of policies in terms of how do we govern data, how do we structure the addressal mechanism, redressal mechanisms, how do we ensure transparency. There are trade-offs as it, in, in all the policies. I mean, if you want to have an efficient system and you put too many controls on the privacy, then it's, it's very difficult to, to understand. If you want innovation and you want to protect the property rights, of course, what happens if you need to share the code because you have harmed some populations? I mean, there are always these trade-offs, but at the end, we need a strong regulations and a strong institutions to mediate for those issues. And this is the call. And this is exactly what we are calling in the, in, the, in the recommendation to ensure that you have the capacities in the governments to understand the technologies, which is not the case yet. I think it's very opaque. It's a very opaque world. Second, to build this responsibility that whenever a technology is developed and produces harm, at least we have the rule, on la rule of law online as we have it offline. And then to, to debunk the notion that it's impossible, you know, because it's so fast and so dynamic, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be breathing down the neck of all the developers to ensure that this is ethical. No, but what Clarissa said is, is perfectly fine. You need to define the general framework and then you go for auditing, then you go for, for checking and, and certification, you do random trials and see how much this is happening or not happening, and you put very clear legal structures that, that, that really cut short whenever there is a danger. The fact is that Europe is looking at, at risk-based approach. I think this is good, but it's not enough. We need the general framework. The US is still not ready to talk about regulations because we're still in the world that regulations harms innovation. Surprise, what is harming innovation is concentration at the top. When we say that productivity is flat, it's because you have this very high concentration in frontier firms that is really not trickling down into the rest of the, of the ecosystem. So I feel we really need to debunk the narrative, but then you need very, very concrete tools. And this is what we included in our, in our work, an ethical impact assessment, a tool. So whomever is developing these things should ask the questions. What are you putting in? What are you getting out? What is the quality of data? Do you have representative data? When you discriminate against women, probably it's because you don't have enough women in the data. If you discriminate against black women, it's because you have less women in the data. But then if you go with the judges, and it happens that if you look for people that are going to redouble their offenses, it happens that they are all black. Well, because probably the data is overrepresenting black people. So all these questions need to be answered. And then we need readiness assessment, but because we should not forget being a global institution, half of the world population is not connected. And therefore, because these are global technologies, 
we need a global discussions and we need to continue, Mariana, as you have been doing it, and I will continue doing, and I'm very pleased that our members agreed with this approach. We need to fix it. We need to yeah. fix it. Thanks. Thanks, Gabriela. And thanks for bringing it back to the toolkit issue. I, I was trying to bring us also into the kind of finance, but maybe given what you've just said, which is so important, we can come back to the tools. You know, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes had this great quote that practitioners on the ground who are just kind of trying to get the job done are slaves of defunct economic theory. And I'm sure Carissa thinks also defunct philosophical theory, but in terms of those better tools and better policy, um, and the fact that we do have now this digital um, act in Europe, and there's sort of discussions about it in the US, if we can just also get our hands now a bit around the meat about what, what's currently being done. I saw in the chat, by the way, I'll just say what's there, which is we can't just be regulating. That's definitely true, and we'll come to that in a minute. But it's, it's about redesigning this regulation. That's what we're talking about, instead of having ex post regulation, given that actually state actors have been and continue to be critical to the investment side as well. Um, you know, like there's a huge deep mind funded um, well, DeepMind itself, of course, came out of huge amounts also of public money, but DeepMind funded lab at UCL and, you know, uh, uh, universities around the world. There's the equivalent of CERN, uh, you know, in physics around kind of AI globally. How do we actually think of both the creation and the regulation at the same time? What are the new tools? So, Carissa, if you want to just come in on that, but also if you want to say anything about the Digital Act in Europe right now, which I don't know if you've looked at it at all, about any comments on how, if we had Vestager with us here, what we would tell her. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm also worried about how much, how, how, how important a role private companies are playing. And this is an area in which in medicine we failed. We actually failed to uh, regulate big pharma appropriately. We did pretty well or roughly well in other areas of medicine. And so we need to think about what went wrong and, and what can we do to fix it. And I completely agree with uh, you, Mariana and Gabriela, that we need governments to build capacities because if government is negotiating with uh, big tech and we don't even have the right uh, people who are trained enough, who understand things inside out, then that negotiation is going to go terribly wrong. And one of the things that we need to think about is power. How is data and in particular AI changing power dynamics? And one of the things that I argue is that there has always been a very tight link between knowledge and power. The more knowledge somebody has about you, the more vulnerable you are to them. And the more power they have, they, the more they get to decide what counts as knowledge. So we need to redress some of those knowledge asymmetries that have uh, led to a power asymmetry. And one of the ways in which we do that is to protect privacy, because as long as companies have most of personal data, they will have most of knowledge and most of the power. And for democracy to be strong, we need the citizenry to have the bulk of the power. Another very important thing to have, into, to have in mind philosophically is that there are no technical solutions to what are fundamentally social and pol political problems. No amount of AI is going to solve our political problems. And quite the contrary, technology in general amplifies power. And if things are going south already and then we develop AI, they're just going to go even worse. They're not going to get better. They're just going to amplify what, whatever is going on. And if we don't have the right governance in place, then we can be worse off than if the technology hadn't been developed in the first place. Um, so technology by itself doesn't guarantee any kind of benefit from, for humanity. Um, so one of the things that was mentioned that I, that I also quite worry about is the source of funding for research, and not only for research in the technical aspects, but also for ethics. More and more I see that big tech is funding and the ethics of AI, and of course, we can't allow them to set the agenda. They're precisely the object of regulation. So you know they, they can't be the ones who set the agenda. So that's something that we really need to fix and, and focus on. And, and lobbying is, is a huge concern. And, and these companies are, in, are investing very, very heavily in lobbying. So in terms of Europe, I think that different democracies have different things to um, to kind of contribute to and Europe definitely has a longer history of regulation and one reason why that might be the case is that there's a, there's more of a commitment towards rights in Europe so I think that 
sometimes people in Europe think that you know Europe is not powerful enough because we're not developing the cutting edge AI or, or not as much as other countries. But actually, the regulatory approach is another kind of power that is incredibly important. And as we saw with the GDPR, for all its faults, and it has many, it changed the discourse worldwide. And it's inspired legislation around the world. So I'm quite hopeful that new legislation around AI, which is still being debated and, and the details of which are still up for grabs, um, might have a positive impact. Now, one concern is like, why are governments going to regulate this is if they are profiting from AI, both in terms of military approach and intelligence and so on and so forth. And I think one possibility to motivate liberal democracies is to think about the competition in terms of, up until now, governments have used, and, and companies have used China as an excuse to not regulate AI, to not regulate personal data. They say like, well, if you regulate us, then we won't be able to um, develop AI as fast and China will, and therefore we will be at a disadvantage. But actually what we're seeing right now are some really interesting developments. First, China has passed one of the strictest regulations in terms of privacy worldwide. And there has been a lot of speculation about what, why China would do that. They have lost trillions in the marketplace. Um, and one, I think one reason they did it is to protect their national security. Every, every data point that's being stored is a data point that will be hacked by rivals sooner or later. So if China is doing that, and furthermore, China is exporting surveillance. So more and more, I mean, even though it still surveils its citizens, it's minimizing the data it collects on Chinese people through regulating companies, but it's exporting surveillance. So it's exporting cameras and other equipment to 150 countries around the world. And when we see that, I think their reaction is very clear. If we want to defend liberal democracy, what we need to do is to export privacy, to export privacy and to export ethics in the right, the right technology, the kind of technology that supports democracy and in the right standards and culture. Fascinating. I'm just so conscious that you're going to leave in 15 minutes and I want to make sure you're here for some of the uh, Q&A. I don't know, Ian, if you want to add something to what's been said before I open up. Um, I, I had some further questions myself, but I want to make sure that Chris is here for some of the engagement with people who are on Zoom. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think that I would echo some of what was said. I think it's something like 89% of uh, top AI faculty have been funded by big tech companies, right? So you're definitely right about that sort of effective regulatory capture. Um, I think in terms of the sort of the regulation that's been passed to date, I mean, I do think that the, you know, the the sort of um, state at a state level, um, there have been some really interesting things in the US like that, that, that the, um, the, the law around um, computer vision um, in Washington state, I think is kind of best in class in some ways. There's a very interesting piece of law passed in Wales as well. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's just sort of these big blocks that necessarily are, are passing the most innovative regulation. Um, you know, my impression of the, uh, the AI Act, the, the sort of the European one is that it's sort of, uh, it seems kind of broadly sensible high level goals but actually you know for example they should be transparent um they should be robust and uh, contain you know uh, be you know be a, have effective over human oversight but i think structurally that's challenging because some of the, the things that are being they're being asked to do are technically not uh, are sort of open technical research questions right so there are aspects of which the the european regulation feels kind of earnest but not necessarily that thoughtful um in China, I think the the personal information protection law, if that's what you were referring to, the sort of the, the kind of um, the one they passed in November 2021, I think that's interesting. And I, I, I think that um, it's quite interesting the way that it, it makes it forces um, Chinese tech services to make consumers aware at any time they're interacting with an AI system. So I think there are some very interesting things actually happening in China. Um, around regulation. And I think we would be kind of, you know, we could all be skeptical of like, you know, the, 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 you know, how, how that, doved, how that kind of um, the, the dissonance with, for example, those kind of um, positions around privacy and what is happening in Xinjiang today. Um, but, but at the same time, like, I think there are, there is, it's still worth like calling out the examples of where Chinese 
legislation is actually out ahead of Europe or the US. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I'd really respond on on the like geopolitical uh, regulation yeah. topic. And of course, on regulation, it kind of depends what sector we're even defining them as. And of course, we're all using the word big tech, uh, but we know also again a lot of the tech has been you know funded outside of these companies, even though they're increasingly funding it. But they are actually operating to a large extent, like media companies, at least some of these companies. You know, Facebook should it be regulated like the BBC? Um, that's a whole other question, but there's three questions here that I wanted to read out uh, that I think can be answered kind of together. And I'd go to you first, Carissa, because of your time. Um, one is this whole issue of, of, of peer review. So considering that computer science, AI, and machine learning are already not diverse in the ways that Gabriella made very clear, should AI algorithms be peer reviewed before being used? Another one about um, inequality. So the one I just read was by someone called Ricky. Then we have Daniel regarding inequality. How can we make sure that the regulations will include the point of view of different countries and cultures, uh, so truly be co-created? I mean, you know, again, coming back to the SDGs, and that the discussion will not only include the elites of the global north. Um, why don't we take these two together? Uh, Carissa, why don't you come in first, and then I'll go to Gabriela and Ian. Uh, sure. And quick comment about what you, you just said about uh, regulating big tech and what exactly is big tech. I think oh. one challenge is to kind of categorize them in the same way. They're kind of... Uh, they're, uh, it's, it, they're difficult because th th there are some new elements. But at the same time, I think this new industry is no different from previous industries that we have regulated, from you know railroads in the past to airplanes and cars and food and drugs and financial services. And of course, sometimes we haven't done as well as we could, but there are at least some moments in history in some co countries in which we, we have regulated these other industries. And and these technology industry is no more complicated. We just need to get a hold of it and kind of categorize it right. But there's nothing magical about it that kind of escapes regulation in any kind of fundamental way. Um, so regarding how do we make sure that um, these algorithms are more inclusive and so on, and, and that we have more diversity? I think there are many ways. One way is just to introduce the requirement that, for instance, every algorithm has to be looked at by an ethics committee, and that ethics committee has to be inclusive in the way that ethics committees in hospitals have to be inclusive, not only in, mat in, in a matter of, of who, what professions are in that ethics committee from ordinary citizens and people from NGOs and a lawyer and an ethicist and a sociologist and a political theorist and so on, but also in terms of uh, gender and race and whether they come from the uh, global north or global south. Um, also, I think, yes, algorithms should be peer reviewed, um, especially ones that either reach many, many people, millions and millions of people, or ones that deal with very sensitive issues in life, like medical uh, things, uh, things related to loans, jobs, or that kind of opportunity. And there would be a, another opportunity to make sure that the algorithm isn't going to disadvantage people who are already disadvantaged. Thanks. Gabriela, did you want to add anything? Yes, I, I, I really I really like the, the, this question. Well, both questions, because, because on the peer review, I, I talk about the general narrative. But then you need to go down, down the earth and say, how do we do it? And that's what I was talking about this ethical impact assessment, because you need to do a lot of questions when you're developing the technologies, when you are the developer. And that's the fact of having teams that are diverse, the fact of uh, not uh, having data that is quality data and well representative, all these questions that you need to answer. But the reality is that one of the most effective ways in which you can really detect biases and, and, and downsides that will reflect later is to have a different team that deploys the development of the algorithm and checks the thing. Because the problem is that you now have teams that are from the very beginning collecting the data, developing the, the, the model, applying the model, training the data, and then applying the, the results. And no wonder, nobody's gonna be checking that out. So I think that even in the composition, as I said, having women, having more, more diverse, Clarissa is gonna be, Clarissa is gonna be very happy to know that of course, here in the human and, and, and social sciences, we need multidisciplinary views. We need philosophers. He, she, she has just proven why we need philosophers. But let me tell you that the, the recommendation that we did here at, the, at, at UNESCO, it was made by 24 experts coming from the North, from the South, and from different disciplines. 
it was the most fascinating conversation I have ever heard because there were people coming from some countries and from disciplines, philosophers saying, do we really need these technologies? I mean, questions that you will never ask because we are in the driving, no, that but this is a fact and we do it, well, maybe not, maybe we don't need it. And so I think this really impressive. But there is another angle that we should need, we really need to be aware, besides the gender inequalities that are three times higher in the digital world than in the analog world, the fact is that we are losing the cultural diversity and the language diversity with these technologies. So the inequalities is not only about the income and the, and the concentration at the top of productivity or, 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 or capacities in the, in the markets, we are losing the cultural diversity because if 95% if of the productions are in English, because what, no? And, and, if, and that's, of course, the, the language processing technologies have more difficulties recognizing Arabic or some other uh, representations of language. So I think we need to be conscious. We need to be conscious because we don't want to develop a world that does not represent the richness of what we have in the real world. Thanks, Gabriela. I wanna to come to one of the first questions that came up by Angel and ask it to Ian, as Ian is here, not only as an IPP professor of practice, but especially a private sector actor. So Angel asked, coming from the private sector, I of course trust we need public-private cooperation and not just more regulation. Do you know any AI developer, user, whether in finance, insurance, labor intermediation, that's a good example of practice on the ground, proactively fighting biases in their data or algorithms? Yeah, so I think there's a, am I off mute? No, you're good. Oh, good, yeah. So I think there's been a few interesting ones. So um, a big tech, big tech in general has been doing good stuff here. So Microsoft, um, they had this database of 10 million faces they were using for computer kind of vision tasks. And they um, there was a, a third party analysis by another company that flagged issues of bias in it um, and, and the kind of consequence using it. And they basically deleted the whole thing. Um, Amazon did a sort of one year pause on letting the police use their facial recognition tool recognition to give Congress time to pass appropriate rules. Um, uh, and then um, there was you know, this is not a, a specifically a tech company, but ImageNet um, was kind of one of the fundamental data sets for computer vision. It was really the, the data set that kicked it all off. Um, and the original team that developed this incredible, you know, data set of, of images that computer vision systems have been trained on, they recruited 12 graduate students representing four different countries of origin, male and female genders, um, different racial groups, um, to systematically identify offensive categories, um, and remove them from the database and then figure out how to basically normalize that data set. So it would be like, uh, have, a, have a, like a, exhibit a lower level of bias um, on an, our algorithms are trained on it. So there, there definitely are some sort of positive steps being taken. And there are lots of people inside these companies who are working hard to try to make things better. Um, so I wouldn't want to, you know, in any way kind of characterize big tech as not caring about the problem. I think it's just actually quite a gnarly problem to figure out how to, how to, how to tackle. Great. So thanks. There's a couple geopolitical ones, but also one on the kind of intellectual property rights, actually a couple of them. I don't know, Carissa, if you want to um, talk about the kind of way we think of rights and, and property <laughs> in this area. But uh, Valeria Bastos asks, AI related patents that do not meet basic sufficiency of description requirements. Um, even in the case of uses of a, oh, sorry, in parentheses, because at the current stage, the inner workings of deep neural network models are not explainable, comma, <laughs> can't read this question. Uh, even in the case of uses of AI prohibited by the European Union, AI acts such as facial recognition, why have AI concerns not reached IPR legislation yet? So um, yeah, property rights and patents. First of all, I didn't even realize that was true. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I have a lot to say on that. Um, but one, one point of contact perhaps is that oftentimes we think about property rights as something that, um, surely defends people in the right way. And because we live in capitalist society, surely if we think about something related to property rights, then it's kind of, it's going to give due protection to people. And, and one example is privacy and thinking about personal data as property rights, and surely if we protect those as property rights, then people will be okay. Um, and that's of course not true. There, there are all kinds of reasons for why 
property rights don't really protect people in the right way. Uh, one of the reasons regarding personal data in particular, I have less to say about facial recognition and other kinds of algorithms, is that personal data is not like property in all sorts of ways. But one way is that if when you share personal data, you, you, you share your personal data, you might think that it's fine to sell it because it's yours, uh, but actually rarely do you only expose yourself, you also expose other people. So your personal data contains data about other people. Um, for instance, um, your, your location data contains data about your neighbors, about the people you work with. Um, your genetic data, of course, contains not only data about your parents and siblings and so on, but also very distant kin who can be deported, who can uh, get refused life insurance. And, and this is not even hypothetical. These are things that have happened. Um, so that's just one example of how when we superimpose property rights on these issues, we kind of miss the mark very often. And my intuition is that that's also the case when it comes to algorithms and so on. Um, we, we, we need to focus on more fundamental human rights to really make sure that these technologies um, don't harm people. That's really interesting, actually, how you put it, because um, Francesca Bria, who used to be the chief technology officer of, of Barcelona City, she's also one of our professors of practice, and she and Evgeny Morozov have been arguing that this isn't about individualizing people's ownership about their data, but actually thinking about the collective and kind of data commons. And in fact, Barcelona itself is setting up kind of a da data commons at the city level also to help the city make better choices with human rights considerations around public transport, public housing, with the data that is being created literally as we, you know, press on Uber, click on Uber, city mapper, and so on. Um, but there is a question about that kind of new institutions, um, Gabriela, because you obviously work in a huge global institution which has human rights at the center of it, but there's different forms of institutions, local, regional, national. And one of the questions by Ushnish Sengupta says, how do smaller countries regulate the use of AI for their citizens in local contexts? I live in Canada and we do not have the economic power of the US, EU or China. And obviously Canada is still big relative to, you know, even smaller locations, but I just brought in also the city level so there's different ways in which different regions and dimensions but also parts of the world in terms of the developing trajectory that they're in can operate so any reflections just from your work around the world with regions of different sizes but also development contexts well i, I have to say that uh, that i have been amazed at looking at how some regions even in mexico the state of Hidalgo is really developing very interesting exercises in terms of uh, regulatory frameworks on, on artificial intelligence. So I would not say that just because you come from a small region or no, I think that you, you can really innovate any size any, and you can dedicate the resources that you need to really inform yourself. And I would say that this is upon us at all levels to be informed and to be aware of what are the, what are the issues that are raised uh, about the technologies. I have to say that one of the most successful uh, examples of, of good regulatory quality that UNESCO provided with was uh, with the bioethics committees. They did not exist uh, 20 years ago. There was this hype about the, the human genome and the cloning and the dollies and, the, and, and UNESCO came out with the declaration of the human genome. And one of the things was that we needed to have institutional innovation and that we needed to create dedicated institutions to look at, it, at these very rapid also changing technologies. And we created these bioethics committees and to learn from each other, what we did was to create a network of bioethics committees and this is global. And this is something that is also useful for, for the regions because I have a global coalition of innovative uh, inclusive cities, 500 and I will welcome the participant to join us because at the end is the peer learning that can help us understand better. It's not gonna be like the one city alone thinking by themselves. No, it's, it, we really need to inform the kind of, uh, of changes we're having now, we all learn together. And I think we need, to, we need to do it. We are thinking that UNESCO, that we need to reproduce that specific uh, 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 experience. And, and the recommendation calls to develop ethics committees or ethics commissions in the, in the centers of governments who have the capacity to do randomized trials and, and to go for, for certification, we cannot be, it's like the restaurants. I mean, you have some norms for safety and healthy food, and you're not gonna go to every kitchen in the world. You're not, 
but you're just going to pick some and do some certification and make sure that they deliver for, for what the regulation is, is providing with. So I feel there is a lot of room for, for innovation and for exchanges at the global scale and UNESCO is there uh, to support. Let me just say, Mariana, to, to come back to the previous question because I, I have very, very strong views about the property rights regime. Yeah. I think that re really needs a full, full revamping. We know what happened with the with the vaccines. It's, it's incredible that even with the worst crisis ever, we could not apply the WTO waiver it's just why, why would we need to do this excessive protection? And at the end, it's true that in, in the in the policy making, you always have these trade-offs, and, and we should not be naive. We should not go to just one. No, it's only about protection. It's not about uh, innovation. It's no. You need to to gulf the issues and balance the issues. But I have to say that one of the outcomes of, of our discussions on the ethical AI is that yes, you need to protect protect the property rights because if not, there is no rule of law. But at the end, at the end, if there is harm, you should open the code. There is no, and, and it goes back to what Carissa was saying and what Ian was saying. It's about the fundamental rights and protecting people that should supersede any other consideration. Thanks. Lady I know that you're already three minutes over the time that you said you'd stay because I know you have another pressing commitment. Is there anything you'd like to say besides saying goodbye or stay on, by the way, if by chance your plans have changed? I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Just thank you so much for inviting me. And, and just to put it into kind of perspective, what's insane is that we have a business model that's funding most of the Internet that depends on the systematic and mass violation of the right to privacy. And that should really make us stop and think what we're doing. And um, thank you so much for the incredible yeah. conversation. And I look forward to the next time. Definitely. And, and we'll stay in touch with you <laughs> now that you're a friend too. Um, <laughs> maybe we can bring it back to the SDGs given what this series is about. Cause you know, if we're going to walk the talk of them, let's at least, at least talk about them a bit more. So, you know, as we said, there's 17 of them and, and I have them in front of me. I'm not going to share my screen. Everyone can just, you know, on Google, just remind themselves what they are, but of course, AI and the whole kind of digital algorithm space, is, you know, goes through them all. So one question is, how should we more explicitly talk about um, AI and the SDGs and how the UN can think about it within the SDG framework? I mean, of course, some of these, whether it's reduced inequalities, SDG 13, um, good health and well-being, gender equality, um, peace, justice, and strong institutions, partnerships for the goals, you know, again, we could talk on and on about them, but, um, you know, we we need a human rights framework. We need an SDG framework if we're going to take human rights and SDGs seriously. And we've just talked a lot about regulation, but just bringing it back to what's the SDG framing? Do you think of this discussion? I mean, either of you. I, I know uh, Gabriela, this is more in your camp, but you know, Ian, maybe also because I know that you talk to people globally. Again, you have a lot of connections across the continents. The SDGs are outcomes of massive intercontinental uh, engagement and yet they just remain there like on posters on pins but how can we use them to rigorize uh, the discussion we've just had i think that i mean i don't know quite what the answer is here but um you know they're certainly inspirational and some of the people being inspired are startup founders so you know a few examples so like uh, the sixth one the clean water and sanitation there's a an amazing company founded by a you know a phd um uh from london based in white city who are basically using machine learning to evolve um uh sort of novel materials that can remove pfas chemicals from the water supply right and that's you know the forever chemicals one of the real you know the 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 sort of the one of the real harmful chemicals in in water and they're using ai to tackle that problem um there are lots of um there are lots of companies applying machine learning to help, um, whether it's developing new drugs like Excience here up in Scotland or the various companies in the US. Um, you know, there's amazing companies applying AI to education. You know, for example, Numeraid in the US is a business that I think has like had 50 million people use it in the last kind of few years. And it's, uh, you know, it's a business that basically um, uses machine learning to automatically sort of suggest um, chunks of content that you might want to consume when you're learning a, a STEM subject. Um, another example kind of uh, around energy, you know, the national grid is using machine learning to do things like forecast cloud cover and try to estimate, you know, uh, you know, like the kind of the, the energy requirements, the, the energy supply into the grid 
Um, and there are numbers of companies working on that on that sort of general problem. So there is an intermeshing between what the private sector is doing and these goals. I just don't know how to maybe make it more closely or efficiently coupled. Um, but you know, I, I think maybe part of it would be starting to kind of use these to, to 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 kind of provide some sort of benefit to companies. Like for example, if you if you are working on clearly working on one of the sustainable development goals, you get a tax rebate for your R and D or, or something like that. That kind of starts to create like like tighter coupling between what the private sector is currently working on and what the kind of the, these these we've kind of collectively agreed these goals are. And 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 Mariana, the the fact is that we go back to where we started. <laughs> The technologies, we develop them. Humans develop the technologies and humans decide how to use these technologies. And therefore, it's not that the, the, by themselves, no, they are going to decide whether they contribute to gender equality or to more democratic societies or to sustainability. It's us that, as Jan said, create the incentives, the structure of incentives to, to penalize those that are creating harms and to, and to fund those that can help us. It's true that the promises of, of using artificial intelligence to track trafficking, no? Or to, or to maximize food production, to know, for example, I, I, I heard about using these technologies to, uh, to learn how to produce better harvest in, the, in Africa or, or to detect cancer, which it seems that is just the diagnosis is just amazing when you combine the technologies with the, with the practitioner. So, so, so it's just mind boggling. The only point is how do we create the ethical guardrails, the rules, the, 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 the structures to ensure that they contribute to that. And for a start, we need to be aware of the downsides. And I don't think that we're really aware. I don't think that we are open enough to say what, what does it entails when you just go for a free ride without looking into the things. It was very interesting because one of the, of the learnings that I have when developing the, the recommendation of UNESCO, we, we went into a global consultation. First of all, you need to bring the citizens. You need to hear the citizens, what do they think? The recommendation we have didn't have an energy and an, an environment chapter. Hmm. And it's so important. Some we say, oh, but it's not mobile, it's mobile telephony. Well, no, some of the some of the developments are so energy intensive that they might equal 130 trips, Beijing, New York, just one development. We need to be aware. So I think it's it up upon us to see how do we develop these technologies to enhance the, the delivery of the SDGs. Right now, they're harming. Yeah. Right now, the, 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 the presence of women or the lack of presence of women in these uh, developments the, the cyber bullying that women are suffering, the, the kind of damage that our girls are having from the, the, from the social networks that actually express themselves for women in a very different way than in express for, for, for men, well, we need to control it. And, and again, is the, is the framework that we can provide. And the framework of, of course is the, is the duty of care for the governments, but it has to be done as Angel, who I salute because he's our, our man in, 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 in Colombia, uh, it, it needs to be because the private companies and we cannot put all the private companies in the same basket because they're very different. And then you need people, you need the civic society, the, 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 the civic participation to really ensure that this is balanced. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna take another question, even though I usually don't read the ones from anonymous people, but I'll assume there's a reason there's no name, but it's a good one. And I'll also add something to it. Uh, how do we guarantee from a policy or governance perspective an equitable implementation of AI in society in light of the limited information we have about the future economic impact of AI? I think how this question has been phrased is interesting, so we should you know, both answer it, but how it's been phrased and how our discussion so far has evolved is emphasizing, because that's kind of our focus, also on the negative impacts, the warnings, how we need better governance to move in the positive direction. But there's also a question which made me think related to this one, which is that we don't actually apply AI enough actually to some areas. And I remember when all the big data stuff started to come out, I always thought, well, we use big data all the time for areas where there's profits to be made, like personalized medicine, and yet we haven't really used it to make better decisions in our welfare policies, like you know, housing, social housing, the UK had this bedroom tax, which is as far away from an algorithm <laughs> that you can go, as far away from anything intelligent and big data. It was literally, how many kids do you have? A number. 
How many bedrooms do you have? A number. Is one bigger than another? If so, you're kicked out and like completely not regarding, you know, the situation of those kids, which schools they went to, if they had mental health issues, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there was all sorts of data actually the government had because of the welfare papers that people actually had to hand out. But that data, that big data, those numbers weren't even used. And it was just a very simple, brutal, mean decision was made on literally, you know, an addition, a subtraction, an equal sign. So are we making explicit choices of not even using the power of AI for some kind of social welfare issues, let alone when we are making this, the decisions and not using welfare principles to, you know, kind of protect people? Sorry, that was a very long, blabby question, but either one of you, I don't know. Um, no, yeah. that's a, that's that's quite a question. <laughs> That's quite a question because because the fact what you are what you are saying is uh, how do we ensure a, equitable uh, implementation? But the fact is is this the question of open science? And there is another recommendation that UNESCO deliver on open science and how do we ensure that the benefits of science are equitable distributed? And it's not the case because again there are property laws, there are innovate, innovation laws that prevent from wider use. Mm. But at the end, what I would say, uh, Mariana, and, and probably the, us here in the panel and those listening to us may have some idea of how these things work, but the rest of, the, of, our, of our societies need more information, need more awareness. They need to know, for example, in our recommendation, we say there is the right to be informed when a decision has been taken based on, 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 a, on an artificial intelligence uh, uh, tool. We need mm. to know. Uh, you need to have the right, for example, to the right to forget that is not codified, but you need to understand. And I don't think that we are investing enough in the understanding of how much this can affect us. We all think about the power of the big tech I can tell you that if there is a big power is because uh, some governments have relinquished their duty of really framing the things in a different way. But I, I'm not gonna complain about uh, companies uh, abusing because the, the, there is the wild west. There are governments using these technologies in ways that they are not even informing. So, and, and I need to have the right to know. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the, in the recommendation too, we, we forbid massive surveillance. Facial recognition technologies, my own perspective is that we should not use them until they are solidly proven that they are not going to be producing the outcomes that they have been producing. So I think that first and foremost, we need to educate. And UNESCO being an institution that is linked to the education is not only about coding, it's not only about becoming a geek, it's about the critical thinking to understand what is at stake and to have the tools to, to protect yourself and also to, to, to ensure that we use these technologies to solve our problems and not to create more. Yeah, and I saw you wanted to come in. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just reflecting what you were saying about kind of, um, my, my vote is for using these technologies if they're less biased than we are, not when they're perfect, right? So I think, for example, autonomous vehicles, once they become better than human drivers, even if they're not perfect drivers, I would be happy having them on the roads because ultimately I'm safer as a pedestrian or cyclist um, if they are safer than a, than a human. Um, I think what's challenging is we're often holding these machines to a higher standard than ourselves, um, which should make sense given, you know, kind of they're developed by corporations and there's a profit incentive and all the rest of it. But I think, um, I think, I think we have to be humble about sort of saying, we should embrace systems that are better than us, even if they're not perfect. Um, and I, I think, for example, um, you know, in the judiciary, in, um, in in the public sector, as Mariana was saying, in terms of devising policy, um, in terms of you know policing, I'm in favour of using these systems. They just need to be in interrogable by um, by third parties. We need to hold them extremely accountable, but ultimately, we need to deploy them. Um, I think with enthusiasm once they are better than we are. Um, at, at certain kinds of decisions. Um, so just a, a slight, a slight, I guess, mod modification from, from me on that. Yep. 
good points. So there's two questions by Megan Misovic. One is just, uh, Gabrielle, if you can put in the chat, she says the network of cities that you had mentioned, uh, there's another network of cities that we um, co-lead with LSE cities at IAPP and UN Habitat, which is called the Council on Urban Initiatives, where we try to arm city mayors across the world. And there's lots of mayors in the council that we run, like the mayor of Freetown, the mayor of Bogota, the mayor of uh, Barcelona, on precisely what we're talking about one of which is how do you actually govern digital platforms in that proactive way and it's also that example from barcelona but gabrielle if you can put that in the chat that's great the other question from megan is kind of in line of what we were just talking about as an evaluator in public health are there examples of public health utilizing ai to plan and evaluate services that you could share um i don't know if either of you uh i mean i I currently chair the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All. And what's interesting is we begin with the objective, you know, health for all, and then we backtrack and say, how do you design the economic system to deliver on that? Which is very different from saying invest in health because it's good for the economy. So how do you govern the intellectual property rights, the public-private partnerships? And there's one question here by Patrick Flynn on that, so we can come to him next. Um, how do you design outcomes-oriented budgeting? So I think a lot of what we've been talking about is you know, given the goal, <laughs> how do you then govern? And the goals, of course, are the SDGs in terms of also this conversation. So in terms of the health, as, you know, related SDGs of which there's lots. I don't know if either of you want to give us any examples, you know. Of... But, but, but I guess I guess that the best example of, of use of artificial intelligence that we have is, is the global pandemic. I think that the track and trace technologies have proven, I mean, it didn't work as well in all the countries, but it was an amazing idea. The only problem is that uh, when you think about, and as, uh, I always think about the, the, the best or the benchmark of the rule of law in the, in the analog world, how do we mirror that in the digital world? And this is one of the discussions we have now because there has been a massive, a massive, a massive um, um, gathering of data because of the pandemic, because of the need of control moving, because of the need of the confinements that is now in the hands of governments. And when you have uh, natural catastrophes, there are uh, catastrophe plans that have deadlines in which your rights that have been taken out from your benefit need to be uh, uh, taken uh, to, to take into account the catastrophe. This time we need to ask ourselves what is going to happen with all that data. But the fact is that it was really useful. And as I said, usually it takes four to eight years to develop a, a, a vaccine. Mm. And mostly, of course, this is the, the trial period and all the, the necessary controls that you need to have in terms of uh, proving that it's right. This time it was eight, uh, it was uh, one year. And that was really because of the use of, of, of these technologies because they can produce analytical frameworks that are just amazingly fast. It will take us years for humans to do so. So I feel that the potential is there. It's just amazing. And probably, yes, maybe some of our friends here that love the AI, may, may, we might sound too negative. No, I think, that, I think that these technologies are just amazingly, incredibly creative and useful. And, but, but there are downsides. And the downsides are taking too much uh, of, of our democracies, of our safety, of our mental health. At UNESCO, we are now looking at the neurotechnologies. And, and what do we do with our neural information? And how do we protect the neural rights? I mean, there are so many issues. Uh, and the, the goal is to have uh, only the positive impacts, of course. Great. So time is running out, and we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to take two of them together and ask um, Ian, you to, to answer it maybe from your, again, private hat on. <laughs> so one is Patrick Flynn. Private investment is key for the success of the SDGs. How do we incentivize or join the dots of how civic improvement leads to commercial? benefits for businesses, so profits. One by Ricky Mohanty, do we see the field of AI and machine learning becoming interdisciplinary eventually in the future? For example, Netflix's data predicted suggesting new things to watch after people watch an episode is purely based on big data and machine learning, but behavioral and qualitative insights revealed that binge watching is what maximizes engagement. Definitely for me. Uh, similarly, <laughs> do we see sociologists, anthropologists, and other researchers contributing towards the design of AI? Yeah, so going great questions. Um, I think the on the SDGs, my I don't have um, the the things I observe being high impact on companies are um, tax and procurement. Mm -hmm. So you know, using this example of the company that works on 
um, designing better materials for removing PFAS from the water supply, you know, they would benefit from some kind of tax incentive that's tied to them clearly driving towards a, a, one of the major sustainable development goals. Mm. The other thing is making it easier for, you know, um, municipalities who want to buy water, water kind of cleaning technology to be able to access um, their tooling, right? So I think there's kind of, you know, procurement tax, probably two, two levers to tie the SDGs to com company behavior. Um, the second question about Netflix, I think, I think in some ways it's maybe an example, um, you know, there's a kind of intelligence that sort of adds complexity and a kind of intelligence that sort of um, drives towards simplicity. And I think the arc of Netflix was basically, they only had other people's content. They had a lot of fragmented long tail content and they needed an algorithm to basically sort through it and try to recommend you something. And I, I remember meeting with Reed Hastings and he was basically explaining to me that like, you know, the, the challenge of recommending someone a good film every single night, five nights in a row, compared to serving up another episode of the same TV show is like trivially easier task on the latter. And I think in some ways, like, you know, Big media companies figured that out years ago. Like HBO has been doing that for a really long time, making great TV shows with, that are very episodic. And so I think, I don't know, I, I think maybe um, there's a lot of applications of, of kind of machine learning, machine learning or AI that kind of introduce unnecessary complexity, frankly. It's like high-frequency trading or something like that. It's kind of this like, you know, at the margins, uh, useful behavior. Um, I think it'd be a lot more exciting if AI could design us a TV show that you want to watch hundred nights in a row or like you know sopranos the wire like that's what we're really really talking about. <laughs> you're hilarious um well that's interesting because my husband who's a film producer <laughs> sorry to bring my family in <laughs> but he says something interesting which is the the experience as an independent film producer the power of netflix and amazon in using these algorithms and creating the films based on them is reducing what you would call biodiversity in the kind of you know biology climate space and yet we we don't pay attention to that so we're increasingly you know what's nice is when you start seeing things that you had no um how do you say prior uh perception that you might like and also funding stuff that's a bit wacky and out there i mean that's the history of kind of independent cinema right so how these platforms, just like wine production, if you think of that famous film, Mondovino, which showed us that we're basically all drinking wine that tastes alike, unless you're, you know, actually know something about wine, as again, my husband does, but okay. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, anyway, yeah, so that reduction of the diversity of our landscapes. I mean, think of what's happening with these dark restaurants, you know, these restaurants that are being set up just for Deliveroo and, um, and Uber Eats to the restaurant landscape. Sorry, you were going to say something, Gabriela? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you that that, that uh, I, I love this question because, of course, I'm the social and human sciences at UNESCO, and uh, and and I'm here to say anthropology, sociology, history, philosophy matters, <laughs> and 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 we did it with the new approaches in the OECD. But this this role of UNESCO in promoting these sciences and promoting the insights of these sciences to inform better is super important. And I wanted to share with you that with the LEAP Center uh, and my friend James Ingram, we, we launched a, a digital anthropology program, which is looking exactly at how do you apply the insights of anthropological studies to understand how people behave and how they interact and what is their culture and how does that is being changed and shaped by our interactions in the digital world. What kind of personalities evolved in terms of your connections and who do you connect? We know the echo chambers, we know the profiling, we know the, so these things, we really need to use all the sciences. And, and, and this is what, it, what we're trying to do here at UNESCO, looking at these issues. The other question about the recommending systems, I'm very, very uh, uh, worried. <laughs> Because the fact is, as long as there is consent, you can use all of uh, the information that you have about what, what triggers me and what I like and what I hate, as long as I know. And as long as I said, yes, you can use it. The problem is many times all these uh, emotions and all this uh, profiling and all this is not done uh, with the appropriate uh, ethical guardrails. And, and of course, the worst example is when you have uh, this, all these people getting into Capitol Hill and you say, but, but how could you match all these people and bring them into fear to go into contest the elections this way? 
there are many other examples, but I feel that all the, 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 the cognitive biases that companies can use to target and profile, we need to be super careful and they need to be applied with full conscience and consent of people. And for, and, and for a reason, the consent rules that we have are not as, as strong as they should. Yeah, thanks. There's a question by Ben Hawes that, that picks up on kind of my earlier point about maximization of shareholder value and the fact we can you know, govern capitalism in different ways and there's different governance structures. He says, are we missing lessons from pre-AI corporate behavior? For decades, we've had complex systems operating in society, acting in ways that affect people to serve fixed and limited objectives that benefit a minority and governed by the if-then processes that, that minimize the discretion of employees. These are called companies. It's widely observed that public companies in particular have become increasingly geared to serve one objective, shareholder value, over public and employee interests. Have we learned enough from the negative impacts of these previous semi-autonomous systems, the structure of companies? That's so interesting to bring to governing AI. If not, I might just be, it might just be more of the same, faster, less discretion, less accountability, more narrowly geared systems. So the kind of stake, I mean, another way to frame this in one sentence is what is a stakeholder value, uh, a governance structure for AI? I mean, I, I think that's a very clever way of framing it, um, Ben, whoever you are. <laughs> um, I think um, this is, a, you know, another way of framing the existential risk, you know, the, the, the kind of commonly cited way of, of kind of projecting what happens if we make a system that's more intelligent than us, that not align with our goals, is it turns us all into paper clips as it solves some other problem, right, which is kind of like another sort of uh, reducio ad, ad absurdum kind of example, like, like the one you drew. Um, so personally, you know, I, I mean, if you gave me a, a, a choice right now uh, to pause AI capability research for a decade or not, or, or keep it moving, I would pause it. I'd choose the pause mm. button because I think it's more likely that we blow ourselves up in the process right now than we navigate this transition, you know, in a way that is, is good for humanity. Um, and so I think it's, you know, the, the historical record is not particularly strong. <laughs> On us kind of you know doing this stuff gracefully and we may only get one chance with 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 sort of artificial general intelligence if we if, if it's going to be the first time in our species we potentially create something more intelligent than us and that's that's a kind of a it's a one-time one-time opportunity to get it right and so being being deliberate about it trying to figure out how to regulate these uh these much larger ai models um, as they're being developed and, and interrogate them for how well aligned they are with human preferences, you know, as expressed in, in lots of different formats, feels to me like probably the most important work of the next 50 years. But, wow. but let me just let me just just add to that very incredible answer. I, I, I might not agree, and I don't think that we can pause, but I would feel like that. But I feel that this is just a continuation of the very same questions that we raised regarding the shareholder to the stakeholder, which is what do we value? What is the purpose? This is something you have been saying, Mariana, but we also have been saying here, what do you reward? How do you define success? Mm -hmm. Do we continue defining success as maximizing profits and financial outcomes? And then we are gonna have the same outcomes. So we need to reframe the issue. We need to reframe the, the, the success or progress only measured by GDP and, 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 and material well-being. We need to look for sustainability. We need to look for equality ex ante. So I think it's for us to shape how do we measure success? How do we define it? I am part of the mission committee of Danone who has declared themselves as, a, as, a, as an enterprise, a mission. And it's not easy because as long as the stock exchanges and the financial authorities continue to ask uh, uh, companies to deliver on the financial outcomes only, it's not easy to, go, to, to swim against the tide. But I think that we should go for it. And there, the capacities of governments to create the incentives framework to, through tax breaks, to procurement assignments, through, through the many tools they have is huge. So I don't think, I, I don't feel powerless. Yeah. I think the only thing is that we need to change the narrative again and to create a, a new definitions to, to really reward those that invest in the, right, uh, in the right issues. Yeah, look, we've gone actually already one minute over time and I think you both really nicely sum things up um, and the fact that you talked about um, 
uh, procurement and tax, uh, Ian, is, is quite good because our next session in this series is about, uh, it's called What's Tax Got to Do With It? Sounds like a nice song. Business Reporting in the SDGs um, on May 19th at 3.30. Um, and the fact that you've just said, Gabriela, yes, you know, maybe pausing would be theoretically nice. We can't, but the fact we can actively shape and create this market, like um, Kadisa was saying all along, that we have done in other sectors, finance, health, and so on. We have tools to do that, procurement, tax, regulation, and so on, but also that kind of ex ante investment. You know, let's learn to do this early, early on, not always pick up the pieces later. This is very central to what IPP is all about with public purpose, public value. So look, we'll let you all uh, move on to your other great things you have to do today. Thanks also to the great comms team at IPP, uh, Tasman, Angelo, and others for putting this on, and uh, Dominique, Alex, Josh Ensminger, our PhD student who's actively taking notes and has been helping IPP navigate this, uh, this whole area globally across different projects. So thanks so much, Gabriela, Ian, and Carissa, who's left. Thanks to our audience who's there, and please do join us throughout the whole series. Tasman has put the... Um, the link to the whole series in the uh, chat. And yes, if we could do some sort of um, 3D printing for you all to give you either a glass of wine or a, glass, a cup of coffee now, we would do it. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> anyway, bye. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. Thank you a so pleasure. much.